It's been claimed by some scientists that we will need 50% more food by 2050 for a world population that will be close to 10 billion. But food production, well, it's a big driver of climate change. How do we do it without killing the planet? Welcome to Roundtable. And a very warm welcome from me, David Foster. How do we keep the planet healthy while keeping all of the people fed? Coming up with a sustainable plan to feed an expanding and ever richer world population is an immense challenge. The world is getting hotter, drier and more crowded. According to scientists, the population of Earth could be too big to feed itself by 2050, resulting in a global food crisis, which raises the question of whether the global food production system is prepared for these changes. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates the world's population is projected to grow from 7.7 .7 billion in 2019 to 8.5 billion in 2030, and will surpass 9.1 billion by 2050. As the human population continues to climb, how do we guarantee a sustainable food future for the planet? Let us first go to Rome, where we can see Lorenzo Bellu, senior economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, with me in the studio. Elizabeth Robinson, professor of environmental economics at Reading University. Paul Newnham with us too, director of the Sustainable Development Goal Two Advocacy Group and Karina Millstone, Executive Director of the Food Campaign Group Feedback. OK, we have admitted, we understand we have a major international problem. Lorenzo, to you first of all. Um, you've prepared a report with colleagues that says it, it's achievable, getting rid of hunger. How do you do it? Well, it's achievable under some conditions, of course, you know, because uh, um, we have prepared uh, recently a report which is called The Future of Food and Agriculture, Alternative Pathways to 2050. This report uh, sheds some light on possible futures. And uh, uh, a possible future is uh, if we keep going like business as usual. Uh, and uh, if we keep going like that, we will not achieve almost any of the SDG targets, the Sustainable Development Goals in Agenda 2030. There is uh, an alternative pattern, which is uh, moving towards sustainability. Is, this is still doable, but the, narrow, the, the pattern is, is, rel is relatively narrow. We have, to do, we have to follow that pattern, which implies, uh, on one side, investing more in research and development uh, to find uh, better ways of producing. On the other side, uh, implies uh, changing, shifting the way we consume food and the way also we waste food. And then, of course, there is also a worst-case scenario where inequalities and abuse of natural resources and climate change uh, exacerbate, uh, exacerbate and uh, we will move uh, very far from sustainability. So these are three possible patterns. It's up to us, up to decision makers, up to the development community to decide which pattern we want to follow. OK, and we'll come back to you in just a moment because there's another pamphlet you've produced which is Achieving Zero Hunger. No, oh, show it to us. Go on. Flash it up on the screen, and then we'll talk about it in a little while. Yep, achieving zero hunger, the critical role of investments. OK, let's talk about that in, in, in just a moment. But it sounds like it is doable, and we do produce enough food, probably, to feed the world. So where's it all going wrong? Can you tell me first? Well, some, some of it's going wrong in terms of where that food is going. So there's a huge amount of food waste at the moment, all the way from um, farm to fork. And so, for example, in low-income countries, uh, very poor storage, very, very poor post-harvest um, processing. And then it's where, where we're sending a lot of that food. So a lot of grain is not going to feed people, but it's going to feed cars, or it's going to feed cows and other livestock. Cars? In terms of biofuels. Yeah, in terms of biofuels going into our cars as a substitute for uh, ga gas, gasoline and, and petrol. So we just need to, to, to switch the way we think, is, is that right? That, that's part of the way forward. Certainly, certainly, if we're going to see 2 billion pe more people in 30 years' time, which that we can't really change, we're going to have to change in terms of what we eat, how we eat, our relationship with nature, how we farm. Aren't we sort of thinking that we want to live, as I'm sure we will do, in, in a perfect world, whereas, in fact, it, it is not sustainable? Because if it's 10 billion 
in 20 years' time, it could be 15 billion by the end of this century. I, I don't know the numbers exactly. That we have to accept the reality that there will be famines, that there will be unfortunate people who cannot get enough food uh, on the I mean, Malthusian principle. I mean, I, I sincerely hope not, obviously, yeah. but I, I do think that Elizabeth raises a crucial point that historically we've always thought we need to produce more and more and more to, to meet the needs of the growing population. Lorenzo mentions R&D investments, you know, how to get maximum yields and GMOs and all that kind of narrative and effort. When actually we now know that by far the single most effective measures to reduce the demands placed uh, by the food system on the natural environment on which we depend are food waste prevention and a shift to plant-based diets. Food waste prevention, this is crucial. We, you know, about a third of the food that we produce is wasted, enough to feed three billion people. We already produce enough food. And in terms of uh, meat and dairy, um, this is by far and away the, the most detrimental types of food that we can eat. About two thirds of agricultural lands are devoted to meat production, be it in forms of pasture or animal feed. And we now know that you know, the transition to a sustainable, low carbon um, agricultural system really is a transition towards plant-based diets where meat might be an occasional treat uh, rather than an everyday food that we have. I'll come to you in a moment because we're talking about sustainable goals here, but going back to your point, Karina, about, about meat consumption. Uh, this was a couple of years ago this report came out. Uh, 1982, the Chinese people ate on average 13 kilos of meat a year. By 2016, it was 16 kilos of meat a year. You're not going to turn back the clock, are you? Look, okay, so one of the things I would say, I, I'd say that we have to be very clear about the world is very different. We cannot have one kind of overarching approach for everywhere. So in some parts of the world, people need to eat more meat. In other parts, they need to eat less. And so we have to actually treat different regions in different ways. And we have to look at this as not a one size fits all. But there are trends, and I would agree, generally, we need to cap meat consumption around the world. And but Indians are drinking more milk, which of course comes from <clears throat> cows. Absolutely. Cattle. But, but I would say, so there's a number of reports and thoughts around this that have come out. And I think it's a shift. We need to start to eat, and I would say, more, more diversity in our diets. So I think that the reality is that up until 2015, we've seen massive reductions in the number of hungry people around the world as food production went up. So we're now producing enough food to roughly feed one and a half planets of the current population. Yet we've still got over 800 million people going to bed hungry. The interesting part is we have over 2 billion people not getting enough of the right nutrients. So while we have seen some, the number of hungry people at uh, around 800 million, we're seeing about 2 billion people that some of which have transitioned as population have grown to have enough food so that they're not under hunger conditions, but they're not getting the right types of food. And so I think from an agricultural perspective, this is something that's really unique. And that's mainly also connected to the whole area of biodiversity loss in our farming. And I'm sure as a... So where did we go... What, in what direction did we go to make it less diverse? So I think what we did was, um, so if you look back, uh, we used to have significant gaps in being able to feed, to create enough food to feed the population of the earth. And so the Green Revolution and many other initiatives worked to say, how do we produce enough calories? How do we get food so that everyone in the planet has food? And so in solving that problem, there were choices made. Those choices have led to, have been doubled down on as things have continued to grow. And so we now see in the most of our farming practice significant biodiversity loss. So we have farms that are only producing one or two things. I think it's something like four crops make up 60% of all calories globally that people consume. But, but, but this sounds to me counterintuitive. Let's go to Rome again, because if you have to change the way that you operate. In other words, you become less diverse because people are hungry. How can you then say we have to be more diverse and still solve the hunger well, problem? Th th that's exactly the reason. Probably um, I was misinterpreted. When I say we need to invest more, is exactly because we need to change the way we produce things. So this means that we have to invest in research and development and finding new and better sustainable ways of producing things. You know? So this means uh, investing more, for instance, in research and development about agroecology, investing more in research and development to adapt uh, precision agriculture to small-scale farmers, 
uh, this needs to invest more in educating consumers to shape their diets in a way that they are not only healthier but also more sustainable. Clearly, there is the issue of meat consumption, which is excessive to a large extent uh, in high income countries, but it is uh, still uh, insufficient in many low income countries. So, we need to rebalance the way we produce and consume. So, so do, you, do you agree with the, 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 the suggestion that it, it's very different in different parts of the world? Not because people's diets are necessarily different, but because you, you, you can't grow the food there or you can't tell them that they can't have meat. It's a little bit like India and China saying, listen, you know, you. You had your industrial revolution in the 19th century. Why penal us for having ours now? They're getting meat now, which they couldn't get before. Therefore, how can you take it away? Well, that, that's, the reason, that's the reason why it's pointless to talk about developing countries and developed countries. This dichotomy doesn't hold anymore because we are all developing. We all have to develop something new and something better. Uh, of course, high-income countries have to reach dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which could cause uh, climate change and uh, are really hampering the possibility of low-income countries to produce. And this implies a huge, I would say, industrial revolution, or a, a, a new industrial revolution, in the sense that we have to change the way we produce things, not only in agriculture, but all across uh, economic systems. And this requires investment in new technologies, in adapting existing technologies to make them more sustainable. And uh, you know, when I say investment, I mean uh, a cost that we have to pay. Because when you invest in something, you give up some current consumption in view of a better future. And we have to be ready to give up something now to change the way we produce and consume. So, so are we all agreed that um, there is enough room on our planet to grow the right amount of food for the population increases that we are envisaging? It's just the way that it's managed at the moment. Uh, and I would posit that one of the major problems is is that there's just so much conflict in the world. Well, I, I mean, I, we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. this is a good question, and I and I do think uh, quite a few of the transition pathways uh, to a sustainable food system do envisage smaller families, and that's achieved ultimately uh, with women's women's and girls' education and access, you know, to humans human rights access to family planning. So that is a very good question you raise, you know, this, this notion of what's the carrying capacity of the Earth. So there is that dimension. I think if we can keep climate change within two degrees, yes, then we can. If climate change actually, as without kind of significant investment, shifts and continues to grow beyond two degrees, we may not be able to grow enough food for people because there is huge areas which are being affected very quickly. And so I would say it's very much dependent on the mitigation that goes on, um, will depend on if we can maintain the ability to produce enough food to feed the population so, well, into the future. What are the economic figures behind all of this? We might sort of talk about the cost of doing this, but actually there's a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. So we already know that the kind of diets that most of us in high income countries are eating, and actually high income individuals in low income countries are consuming is bad for our health. So if we move to a more plant based diet, we're actually going to improve our health and that takes the pressure off our health systems. So it's not necessarily a cost. So in terms of is food in the right place and is it affordable, that's not a cost to the world. Actually there's benefits from us changing our diets. In terms of the fact that realistic the yields are still very low in some countries, especially in African countries. There are costs, so we do need to make large investments in improving yields, improving the soils in African countries, a lot of which have been mined, they haven't been invested in. But I think we have to look first at the opportunities. I think, I think Paul's point, um, combined with um, Karine's point, are really important. That agriculture to date has really been part of the problem when it comes to climate change, but it can be part of the solution. So the way we grow our crops, if we use conservation agriculture, so we're not releasing so much carbon. What dioxide. would you say then, any one of you, to, to, to a farmer who's grown up doing the job that he does the way that he does it, um, is looking at the way the world is changing? What, what would your suggestion be? I, I would try to, to convince him that uh, what we do now is not exactly what we will be, we'll be able to do in the future. In a sense that uh, in Italy now, you have 40 degrees, you have a heat wave, which is very strong. Everybody can feel that, you know. Whether this is uh, something related to uh, climate change or not, uh, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to link a single event uh, to a climate change trends, that's for sure. But people start developing a feeling that something is going wrong, you know. And farmers are the first, because they are the ones uh, who see insects coming from uh, other continents, which were not, which were not present uh, 20 years ago. 
we farmers are the first uh, who see uh, sickness of cows, for instance, and uh, other problems related to water availability mm. that were not so strong now. So even in Italy, you know, I have a good arguments to, to, okay. to discuss with farmers about the fact that we need to... All right. I, I, under, I understand it's, it's with the best intentions, but any one of you can take this one on. I, what about Farmer Brown, who says, I think that's brilliant, but hang on, I still need to feed the family next week. Well, I, I think that's a really, really important point, that actually we can't just expect consumers and producers to just make the change. And what we really need here is strong leadership from government, because what we really need is a transition on a par from the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Green Revolution, to a new farming system. And in that context, you need new skills, you need new techniques. Uh, and farmers who've, been, you know, who've grown up, who've got used to industrial fertilizer monoculture, will need to adapt and change. So I think it's a question here of like the transition of livelihoods uh, and how do our... All right, so you, 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 you're saying when there's pressure, it. let's say the UK, when there's pressure on the National Health Service, which costs a fortune, uh, when there's pressure to build more affordable housing, it should be a government priority to turn around and say, actually, let's not put some of your taxpayers' money to that. Let, let's so, teach the I farmer down the road yeah. at a, a new college to do something different. So where, where, do, where do most of the health costs come from? They come from food, nutrition. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the right nutrition from up until age two, you, you don't get a starting point. There's massive obesity, um, NCDs that are growing, non-communicable diseases that are, that are growing and putting a huge cost. Now, the investment should have been done a long time ago. It hasn't. So you've, we've got to kind of accept that, move on. Um, but in terms of the agricultural system, I would say the farmers know we need to change because, you know, they see it day to day. They see it on the ground. What they need is support to do that. And at the moment, the system is built around producing high yield to drive low cost at the supermarket. And so we want to pay a very little amount for our food, even though it feels high as a percentage of income. In most of the developed world, we are paying very little for food. Um, instead of looking at increasing the value of that food, valuing high nutrient levels and diversity rather than high yield crops. So we've, we've got a system built on, on producing calories at a cheap, easy, affordable way rather than producing nutrients, which we need, at a more diverse um, uh, system. I, sort of, I, I, get, I get that argument. It's really interesting. It, is it that the cost of the, to, the, to the countries and to the planets is, is far greater if we don't do anything? Then if, if we do what Lorenzo is suggesting, what, what everybody around here is saying, I, teach farmers to farm differently. Well, I think farmers generally respond to markets. It's a system that, that, that isn't working properly. And Lorenzo wanted to say something at this point, so let me bring him in and then yeah. you can yes. add some more. I wanted, to say something, I wanted to say something about the prices, you know. In the scenario that we built uh, moving towards sustainability, we observed that food prices increase, you know. So food prices have to reflect the actual cost of production, you know, the actual cost of producing food, which is not the case now, because uh, we have plenty of environmental externalities and also social externalities, which are not reflected into the price of food. You know, probably the price of food has to increase, but at the same time, also the income of poor people has to, incre has to increase in order to make food affordable to them. Until now, we have followed the policies uh, to increase yields at any rate, to, to have cheap price for to, to, to have cheap food for everybody. It doesn't work like that anymore. We need to have uh, prices reflecting the value of food, the real value of food. But this implies that also incomes of people has, uh, has to shift. Uh, otherwise, we will observe. Uh, but it all sounds it all sounds incredibly altruistic when, in fact, we live in a capitalist society, and you're talking about people doing something for the greater good of the whole planet, effectively turn turning us into a global collective farm, uh, paying people more money, giving them more food, when, in fact, we're talking about massive corporations but, but, that's but running think, this. But I think um, when we talk about climate change, which is, you know, one of the things we can't avoid, this is a global public good. So we can't start looking at the individual. We do have to actually talk about institutions changing completely. And if we believe that within the capitalist system that the incentives are wrong... But this is altruistic, isn't it? How are, you going to, how are you going to it's not convince it's not the guy who owns 200,000 acres of wheat fields in Canada who can get... It? But I think that's the wrong you... question. We need to OK, please, please, I'm open, I'm open to <laughs> suggestions <laughs> the right questions. The I don't mind. But 
we need to change we need to change the incentives at a country level and at a global level we're not asking individuals to be altruistic i think and we need to question the extent to which the corporate actors are well positioned and adequately structured to deliver the change that we need i mean i think how do you make them want subsidies I mean, well, subsidies the subsidy at the system. global agricultural system yeah. subsidising farms that don't necessarily make sense. Indeed. And they're being subsidised at a mass scale. And that was potentially started to do the right thing, to create the calories, the green revolution, to get um, m mass yield. The reality is now that subsidisation continues to happen. And so these grains are flooding the market. Um, and often thus distorting local value and prices. So we need to see the subsidies shift. We also need to see our, the investment in, in, in agricultural development increase. It's been on decline. So while we need to do all this change, I think it was at 20%. Um, some years back, it's down to about 10%. So it's being reduced, the focus on agriculture. So we need to increase our aid um, budgets, but we also need to reorientate our subsidies. If we reorientate yeah, you know, the subsidies... Karina, I've got a question, yeah. but yeah, carry Can on. I just say just an example yeah, yeah. of a subsidy system that's, you know, where things have gone so badly wrong. So, you know, in the UK, we have a huge sugar beet industry. Uh, sugar beet farmers are being subsidised to produce a product that is actively bad for us and depleting the soils of East Anglia on a massive scale. But it brings income to this country sure. because we're selling it abroad then, where there's an no, appetite no, no, for But this. then, of course, we are, you know, then the NHS is picking up the pieces uh, in terms of obesity. So here there's a massive misalignment in terms of environmental goals, health goals and farmer livelihoods. It livelihood. seems to me that everybody's advocating change, but change on a global level that is instituted by individuals and, and, and the smallholders, if you like. Farmer Jones... Um, people at home, who's going to... Let's ask Lorenzo. Is your argument going down well with those who can bring about big, instrumental, world-changing change? Look, Dara, I, I fully agree with people who say that uh, individuals act on, act on incentives, you know, and uh, individual people, whether they are farmers or consumers or processors, they work in an institutional context. If the institutional context is such that uh, allows you to pollute, for instance, water, to pollute the atmosphere, to emit greenhouse gases without paying the bill, clearly you do that, you know, because you're not altruistic. I agree with you. People not necessarily are altruistic. If you're instead in an institutional context which charges you for what you pollute, the resources that you use, and uh, it forces you to reflect these things in your production costs, uh, clearly the situation is completely different, you know. Let's be clear, we need to produce more, you know. 30% people more by 2050 may imply that we produce more. And uh, when I say we are on a narrow pattern, I mean that we have still to identify the right techniques uh, to produce more with less. Can I ask you this question? In a moment, yeah. if you don't mind. Can I ask you this question? If we talk about population growth, if we talk about the amount of food uh, that could realistically reach that population, there may come a time when we haven't got quite enough food. Or it's easier, because of the rise of artificial intelligence, which has taught us so many things we didn't know, to stop eating food, to actually just pop a pill like they do in space. Do you think that's a possibility, that one day food, as we know it today, will not exist? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think anything that can help to lessen the environmental impacts of the food that we eat is a good thing because, you know, it is ultimately agriculture that has destroyed the planet, ultimately biodiversity loss, climate change. So these kind of foods out of nowhere, maybe? I would, I would uh, disagree. Yeah. So I would say food is more than just what the benefit it gives us in our stomach. Mm -hmm. So food is actually cultural. It's about how we gather as community. It's how we connect to our own identity. But perhaps we won't exist as cultures if we carry on eating Sure. Food. I mean, we can... We yeah. might have to have, you know, frozen meals, ready meals, the ones and that I, the American I, I soldiers have. I believe there have. will be. I believe there will be a mix, and I believe that some people will choose that. They're already doing that. And in some situations where there's conflict, where there's no, there's no other option to to access, maybe that does make sense. But I've seen refugee camps where food's being handed out and families are taking that food, which probably gives them enough for 80% of the month that they have. They'll take that food right behind and sell it at a loss and then go and buy the food that they actually prefer. So food preference, I think, is incredibly important. And it culturally, people will choose to eat things they enjoy over 
having even enough. Only if they can, and they don't believe it's killing the, the planet. Either way, we're headed to hell, aren't we? I don't think we're headed to hell. Uh, as long as we seize the moment that I think we do have an opportunity at the moment, I think there's a lot of awareness just now through um, Extinction Rebellion, through the, through the school children who are going on strike every month, through a recognition that, that our relationship with the, the Earth is changing. Uh, in terms of population, Population looks like it's going to peak not much after 2050. So I don't think we're yeah, looking at massive population falling, they? increase. They're falling rapidly. Yeah. And we can already see peak population in countries like China. But I think this relationship with food is really important. And I think it's important that we don't lose that. And in fact, I think the way agriculture will be more sustainable is if we start to appreciate where our food comes from and the benefit it can do for us and the harm it can do to us if we eat wrongly. And exactly the same with the planet, the harm we're doing to the soils. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it has been nourishing. It's been fascinating. Thank you for coming on the programme. Lorenzo in Rome, we appreciate the time you took out. Very busy day out there. And thank you to the three of you for thank coming. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you for watching. From me, David Foster, goodbye for now. <laughs>